Great. Welcome, LA Progressive community. Uh, we are really happy today to have Sharice burton Stelly, who's going to be joining us and talking to us about a book that I just recently learned that she has published. And uh, let me just give you a little bit of her background. And, and Sharice, you please just go ahead and correct me. But according to the bio that I have on the LA Progressive, you are an assistant professor of Africana Studies and Political Science at Carleton College. And you received the yeah, stop. Okay, I'll no. stop and you go ahead and, and speak. No, I'm an associate professor of African American Studies at Wayne State University. Oh, well, I'm just all wrong. <laughs> it's probably an old one. You know, I don't know how updated my stuff is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you did receive a PhD in African Diaspora Studies uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. And you specialize, so your specialization includes race and political economy, Black political theory, anti-Blackness, anti-radicalism, and Black radical thought. Yep. That sound good? I have to tell you that you really impressed the hell out of me. It's one of the reasons um, I first saw you on, um, um, oh gosh, what is the young one? It's another young woman that really impresses the hell out of me who is Ms. Bernie Sanders Communications. Um, uh, Brianna Joy Gray. Yeah, Brianna Joy Gray. Um, one of my missions in life is to one day meet Brianna Joy Gray's mother. <laughs> I wanna meet the woman who raised that child. <laughs> <laughs> She's great. So anyway, uh, so that's, that's how I knew about you. Uh, I saw you on her podcast um, and I'm one of her uh, followers on Patreon. And I said, oh, I, I, I want to know more about this person and how she came to know the stuff that she knows. Because clearly, you don't pick up the knowledge that you have simply by going to public schools in the United States. <laughs> Am I wrong? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's taken me quite a few years. I am in the areas of anti-blackness and in radical black thought, I'm self-taught. So I didn't learn anything that I've learned, um, you know, at the about black radical thought or anti-blackness through the university system. But generally what I do is I find out about people like you and people like her, and then I pick up on what you've read. And then I go and I get those same books. And then I'll reach out and say, is it okay if I publish what you've written on the LA Progressive? And thank you so much. You said yes. So let's talk about this book. And I'm going to see if I can show it up here. Does it? Oh, yeah, I can hold that up. Um, organizing, Organized Fight Win. And it's Organized Black uh, Communist Women's Political Writing. I want to kind of almost do a redo of what you did recently at a bookstore where you signed my book. Sure. So um, just, you know, to give like a broader overview, um, Organized Fight Win is an edited volume that um, Jody and I, uh, Jody Dean and I put together largely um, over the start of the pandemic. So in 2020 is when we compiled a lot of these writings um, and then sort of drafted the introduction and the, the section introductions for the book. And, um, you know, broadly we're interested in having um, a primary um, a sort of archive of primary text that complemented a lot of the secondary literature that's been produced over the past sort of 10 or 15 years about um, Black communist women. So there's a bunch of biographies. Um, there's books like Eric McDuffie's Sojourning for Freedom and Dale Gore's Radicalism at the Crossroads and Cheryl Higashida's Black Internationalist Feminism. Um, and of course, Carol Boyce Davies kind of had this sort of um, germinal work um, on Claudia Jones, published in 2008, Left of Karl Marx, which is a biography, but it also does kind of more than that. So, um, but we what we noticed is that there were no sort of collections of primary documents. So the, the words of these sort of Black leftists or Black communist women themselves, other than, so Carol Boyce Davies does have um, the text um, of, of Claudia Jones's works. Oh my gosh, the name is is slipping me right now okay. but it is yeah so so what you can do when it when it comes to you just send it to me and then I'll, I'll put up a little something in the you know I'll edit this video so mm -hmm. that you can insert the name 
Okay. I can't believe I can't remember it because it's like something I use all the time, but it's just, you know, brain fart. Anyway, so she has that collection of of, of Claudia Jones's, um, Claudia Jones Beyond Containment. That's what it's called. <laughs> Beyond Containment. So she has that collection, but, there, but people like Louise Thompson Patterson and Esther Cooper Jackson and other people who we collect in this volume, there's not, there wasn't a sort of place to get their primary documents. And so that is, that is kind of why we put this together. And so in fact, you know, before I start, Jody and I, we just kind of like to read the names of the women who are collected in this work. And so we've got Ella Baker, Charlotta Bass, uh, Dorothy Burnham, Williana Burroughs, Grace P. Campbell, Alice Childress, Marvell Cook, Esther Cooper Jackson, Thelma Dale, Tyra Edwards, Vicki Garvin, Yvonne Gregory, Lorraine Hansberry, Dorothy Hunton, Claudia Jones, Maude White Katz, Louise Thompson Patterson, and Islanda Good Robeson. And so the book is organized into five sections that are um, it's it's relatively chronological because um, a lot of the themes are overlapping, but there are sort of kind of overarching um, titles to the different sections. So we start off with like struggle in the early years, and that is kind of um, focused on the work of Grace Campbell and Williana Burroughs, who are two of the earliest women to join the Communist Party. Um, Grace Campbell was one of the founding members of the African Blood Brotherhood, which later on merged with the Communist Party. And so um, the next section um, is titled Organizing Labor and Militancy. And this looks um, a lot at um, the unionizing efforts of Black women, as well as um, the ways that they put Black women's labor at the center of their analysis of capitalism and imperialism, especially in the 1930s and 1940s. So there's also sort of thinking about the, the super exploitation of Black women's labor. So for example, we have the Bronx slave market in that section, um, which is a piece about uh, that was uh, produced by Ella Baker and Marvell Cook about Black women who were um, selling sort of their um, contingent and um, piecemeal labor on a corner in the Bronx um, for very, very abysmal wages during the height of the Great Depression because of the ways that they have been pushed out of other, other labor markets um, and even have been pushed out of more regularized forms of domestic labor. That is so amazing to me. I don't know if you know this, I was born in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, you know, when you talk about that, I know my mother, my grandmother, they, li they lived there then. You know, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, did they know about this? Uh, sadly, my, both my, my mother passed away just a year ago. My grandmother's been gone now for 10 years. So, um, but I still have an aunt who's old mm -hmm. enough and who lived there then that I can ask you, were you aware of this? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so, and interestingly, so they give the, so let me, let me flip to this. Um, section. So they give the cross streets, um, 167th Street and Jerome Avenue. Oh and my I, goodness. And Are you Simpson kidding me? And Westchester. Yep. That's where it was. So when I was born, I lived on Jerome Avenue. Mm hmm. So that was one of the, you know, um, so I imagine at this time, the space was largely sort of black and Jewish because part of what they talk about in this piece is that it was largely Jewish housewives who were actually the arbiters of sort of um, paying these women terrible wages or paying them no wages at all, because this was kind of the first time they had ever been able to afford um, a domestic, you know, a domestic servant. And so, you know, there's something to be said about class formation there. Um, the next section is, is called Fighting Fascism. And this has a lot to, this is kind of the World War II and immediate post-war post -war period. And what's really interesting about this section is that, you know, oftentimes when we think about fascism, especially in the United States, the focus is on the white working class um, or on the sort of um, declassed petty bourgeoisie, right? The, they're the, the effects of sort of economic conditions on them is kind of what is said to be um, a harbinger of fascism. But part of what these women do is they put Black women's realities at the center in terms of their organized, or Black women um, in particular, but Black people generally in looking at the sort of rise of fascism in the United States and kind of challenging this myth that the U.S. went in and defeated fascism abroad because part of what they say is, is that if you look at the material and racial conditions in this country, this is an incomplete project. Like fascism is still very much alive and well. And this so in the fourth, yeah, this is it. I, I just I get so excited. I'm I just get so excited hearing you know that this scholarship has continued. There is a part of me, and I want to get into that. 
that you, you wrote a piece called Bridging Scholarship and Activism. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why, you know, when you talked about the Bronx, what was occurring to me was there has always been a push uh, by Black women to try to create the democracy that this country says it's all about. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, has the percentage of Black women that have been fully engaged in this movement, has that percentage increased or has it always been just a small percentage? Well, I mean, I think it depends on what you what you mean by democracy. You see, Black women in this country present a real dilemma because, I, you know, everybody talks ad nauseum about how Black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party and its most, most faithful constituent. Um, and so what does that mean for the fact that the Democratic Party is an imperialist party? It is one faction of you know, one faction of the, the one party state, you know, as Julia said, it says, you know, the United, the United States is a, a one party state, but in typical U.S. extravagance, they have two. And so this is touted the idea that black women are the sort of backbone of the Democratic Party is, is supposed to, you know, it's how it's their sort of progressivism or the ways that they, you know, put in so much of the Democratic Party, even though they continually get almost nothing out. And so that begs the question, what is the role of Black women in terms of being the caretakers of empire and being central to the negotiation of the terms of our immiseration? And so I think that the the democracy that people like a Kamala Harris or even a uh, Ayanna Presley or Stacey Abrams believes in is not a democracy that these women in this text would would be struggling for because they fundamentally understood there really is no political democracy without economic democracy at the same time that they were struggling for uh, particular rights, civil rights, right, or, or human rights, um, even as the sort of horizon, the political horizon was much, was much broader than that, right? Ultimately, they're dedicated to, to socialism and Black liberation. And so, um, you know, to make a short story long, I suppose that, you know, you know, to the extent that Black women have believed in the U.S. project, they have always believed in a particular enunciation of democracy that I don't necessarily believe is democracy. Um, but they also are represented among the ranks of these sort of Black communist and communist adjacent women that we we discuss in this text. And so, you know, I think that we need to be sober in our analysis and not sort of give in to identity reductionism and when we're thinking about what what a dedication to democracy actually means and what role black women actually play you know when we say that they're the most progressive we're the most progressive demographic that actually needs to be unpacked especially in relationship to imperialism and capitalism yeah yeah i agree with that when i say that there's been a small percentage of black women in the movement marching towards democracy i don't I don't mean to have that misinterpreted to mean that I think that what we have right now is democracy. I don't think mm -hmm. the United States has ever engaged in democracy, nor do I believe that the United States or the founders of the United States ever intended for there mm -hmm. to be democracy. I don't believe they ever intended for there to be democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that the most oppressed have wanted democracy. What mm -hmm. I often wonder about is how honest we can be considering the consequences of our honesty, how um, explicit we can be and how we define what we believe democracy is. I mm -hmm. think that there are many more of us who are um, I, in, from an ideological standpoint really embrace socialism, but would be reticent in doing that because of the consequences of that explicit embrace. And I don't know, you know, how you feel about that. And a lot has to do with, you know, the time spent on the planet. You know, um, I came of age or came into adulthood considerably long, long before you did in an era where to be considered a socialist puts you in the crosshairs of some very nasty people. Mm -hmm. And so you never really know what people truly believe because they have to kind of stay undercover. That's right. You know, part of part of what I say often is that, you know, the, 
the one thing the United States hates as much as Black people is this communist, you know, socialist, Marxist, whatever. At the same time that, you know, what have Black people gained through fidelity to capitalism? Because even, you know, part of what, going back to like, you know, the 1880s, 1890s, part of what Ida B. Wells conveyed is that being too good at capitalism or being too good at accumulation is actually the basis of lynching. And so it's a real Procrustean dilemma, right? You know, Procrustes. And so you can be, you know, a covert socialist or or shy away from socialism um, as a method of protection, but capitalism hasn't saved anyone. And in fact, again, being relatively successful, I wouldn't say as a capitalist because Black people own no means of production, but at embodying that ethic and focusing on accumulation um, has also been dangerous. And so it's really a question of, and so, so you know, part of the, I think, utility of a work like Organized Fight Win is to show that there is an alternative um, that, you know, that, it is not just, you know, Kamala Harris or even Ilhan Omar. Like that's not our, that is not the limits of our political imagination. That women have been not only advocating socialism, but practicing it in real time. And I do think Black women have been integral in a particular practice of, of a sort of everyday or a quotidian socialism, right? out of sheer necessity. Now, I think socialism as an ethic and a politic is moving it from that realm of necessity or that realm of, of lack or duress to an actual, way, an actual way that we organize our lives. And so, um, you know, I, I just, I'm not, so, I'm not sure. I, I, you know, I love, I love Black people. I'm Black. It's all of my work is rooted in our experience. But, you know, my people, my people. Sometimes I just, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's it's hard because you have come to um, embrace certain theories that were put forward by others, but these aren't theories that you were born knowing. It required right. an education, and there's a certain privilege in being able to gain that education. And not all of us. Now, I don't include myself because I do believe I am self-educated, and I and I'm educated as well in the traditional way, but I'm certainly self-educated when it comes to matters of being Black in America. I'm self-educated, you know, through reading books like this, and also self-educated just by living in this body. But there are those who just don't have that kind of discretionary time to read these books, you know? Um, one thing that really helped me to understand that more than anything else is in um, publishing the LA Progressive, which my husband and I have done for 15 years. And it's really hard to get black female writers, partly because we don't generate any income. So we can't compensate our writers with a financial compensation. We can compensate them with providing an attractive platform, with promoting their work on social media, you know, you know, so because you've done it too. And it's very good, especially if some someone comes from academia and they're already writing, then that's a win-win for us. But to get white men to write, you know, a dime a dozen, they beg us. I mean, we publish uh, anywhere between 12 and 15 articles every single day. And the rule is we cannot publish without at least having one black person a day, some black person writing which has led to me writing two or 300 pieces. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't set out to do that, but I set the rule. So then I have to make sure that there's always some black person, some black person's investigative piece or, or um, opinion piece, well-researched, um, not just, you know, just pulling information out of your butt. But it's hard to get black people's writings because we just don't have the discretionary time unless we're in academia. I, I don't I don't know if time is the issue. I, I I don't I don't know that I agree with that just because I know some of the most I know a lot of of black sort of working class and lumping people, right? And they know every single sports statistic in the world. So they know, and they are, they're brilliant people. They just don't have a particular type of book learning. So I don't think that it's not a question of time. And as we know, when we look at 
the material conditions, so many people drop out of school. So many people are structurally unemployed. So there is time. Now, I think the question is skill because we also know like something like 60% of Americans are functionally illiterate. They can't read, right? Or they can read, but they have, they don't have any sort of comprehension of what they read, right? So they can read the wow. word. Where, yeah, it's a lot of people, right, across across the racial spectrum. Obviously, it's concentrated among racialized people. And so I think, I don't think it's a function of time because I also know so many working class people who are autodidactic. They read the paper every day on their, like, whether they're on the bus to work, whether they're, you know, it's after work, whatever, it's, whether it's on their lunch break. And, um, and so... Uh, you know, and I push back and I don't think I, I'm not um, saying that this is what you're engaging in, but there is a sort of anti-intellectualism, I think, that makes it seem that um, only sort of petty bourgeois <laughs> or sort of privileged people can read or should read and that any emphasis on reading or study is like a is class antagonistic, which is simply not the case because there's a lot of dummies in academia. It's probably mostly dummies and they're lazy. Um, and some of the smartest people I know do not have any formal training or formal degree. And even, and you know, as you were saying, I'm formally trained, but probably everything I learned about what I do, I'm autodidactic. I read it on my own. I learned it on my own. Right. And so, and then now there's also, there's so many podcasts, there's, there's just so many other ways of, of knowledge accumulation, right. That there's blogs like Hood Communist or, you know, your um, LA Progressive Black Agenda Report. And so, I think that this idea that it's time is incorrect. I think it's propaganda. I think it's the fact that we're encouraged to be entertained and not uh, and not informed. And I do think it's the fact that a lot of people can't read, literally. So. Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are a whole lot of things that we need to accomplish. And you're right. That is one big one. I don't talk very much about that because um, it's just, I do know so many people that way. Obviously, I publish a publication. I will tell you with a high degree of confidence that there's probably nobody in my family that reads the LA Progressive. And this is something I've been doing every single day for 15 years. Right. So, um, but I, I just, I don't even go there. I, I just don't, <laughs> I don't even talk about it. Well, yeah. Cherise, um, I try to keep these, these, um, these interviews like less than 30 minutes. I want to catch up with you again. I want to thank you for introducing us um, through this book to all of these phenomenal Black women. Um, I have just uh, was one person whose name I'd never heard of was Claudia Jones. Mm. And uh, that was just, it's just awesome, you know, to know that these women are out there. And hopefully by you sharing the information that you have, more people that are listening right now can share the information about black women who have black women who have played an essential role in this country and are just always just dismissed and disregarded and forgotten to history. Mm -hmm. So, so thank you, Cherise. Thank you for your brilliance and um, have a happy happy new year. Thank you for having me and happy new year to you as well. Okay, so long. All right, bye bye. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.